I'll tell you the people who are the best is, so remember, I was only with the agency seven years, but somebody who's been there like undercover for 15 plus years, meaning guys who've been there long term, they've been in the same cover, they've been in the same place. Like for instance, my buddy over in Japan, 20 years, right? Give or take. Like the guys that have lived that lie so long, it's become second nature. I mean, the Cordy Wagon thing, think about a, a TV show actor who's been doing the same role for 10 seasons. They are so good, so absorbed in that role, they don't have to think about it anymore. That's so crazy to think that people do that. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and Thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start uh, a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money Show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm going to do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by N. Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early-stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early-stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C.com. Jason Hansen, welcome to the What Is Money Show. Thanks for having me. Great to have you on. Uh, just by way of quick introduction, you are a former CIA officer and current private security entrepreneur. Um, I've talked to uh, Andrew Bustamante, had him on the show, and he <laughs> we did a good episode on psychological tools of, of CIA operatives. Very interesting conversation, um, just into the nature of that, that type of work. And so I thought we'd get into some of those, uh, related topics today, like based on your background and history, uh, in the space. And maybe we could just start with your background. You know, who are you? How did you get into this line of work and what was your journey, uh, into working for the CIA? Sure. I, I can give you the kind of 30 second version. So I was born and raised just outside of Washington, D.C. in Northern Virginia. And of course, when you're born and raised there, every government agency is in your background. I mean, the CIA, the FBI, Secret Service. And I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I wanted to work for the CIA, the FBI, the Secret Service. I applied to a gazillion agencies. And that's the big myth about the agency is, of course, there's the movies, the recruit out there and everybody thinks, oh, everybody gets recruited. No, no, no. Like 1% of people get recruited. 99% of people apply and go through the long and arduous process. So I applied everywhere. And my first job out of college was I was a police officer. And then it just so happened shortly after that, uh, the exact same week, the CIA and the Secret Service called and offered me a job. Figured the agency would be a little more exciting. So I went with the agency and it was a wonderful place to work. What, so why they? you said they called you the first week you were on the job. Is that right? No, no, no. What I meant was so shortly after I got a job as a police officer, yeah. uh, the same week I had the Secret Service and the CIA offer me a job, just like total coincidence. Both call me and 
obviously I'm with the agency and I mean, a wonderful place to work. Of course, there's a lot of Hollywood miss, but it's really good. Amazing men and women there. And what is it about you? Did they tell you why? Like, was there certain characteristics they selected you for? Like, how was the, what was the evaluation process and, and why did, why were you chosen? So, I mean, it's a, obviously a very long process. From the very first day I applied, it was about 12 months until I actually got the job. Uh, you, of course, have to fill out background check mounds of paper. I'm sure a lot of it's electronic these days, but you fill out a ton of paper. You obviously have to have them talk to your friends and neighbors and family and all that. You have to have the psychological evaluation, which means you meet with the shrink and they make sure you're not crazy. You have to pass the polygraph. You have to do a medical exam. So pretty much what it is, is how clean is your background? Are you an idiot who you know, had, did something stupid back in the day? So as long as you're squared away and have a clean background, I, again, I was one of the lucky ones. Gotcha. You said you had to pass a polygraph. Is that a lie detector test? Yeah, yeah, the lie detector test. So you go in there and you know they sit you down in the chair, they strap you up, you're staring at a, a white wall. So it's, you know, you're just staring at a wall. And I was in there for a few hours. Like my background, I didn't have anything exciting, nothing crazy, nothing shady. So I was in like one day and I was done. But I knew people who after day one, they were like, eh, your results, you know, something's not adding up. We need you to come back for day two and sit in a few hours. But that didn't happen to me. That did happen to some friends of mine. So they're asking you questions about your background to try and dig up anything that might disqualify you? So yeah, they always baseline you first. So they always say, you know, hey, is your name Jason Hansen? Is today Tuesday? Is this carpet green? Is this wall white? Yes, yes, yes. And then, you know, things like, are you working for a foreign government trying to overthrow the United States government? Do you have any, and you know, I'm just making these up, you know, do you have any relatives who work overseas? Is, you know, do you do drugs? Do you still, have you ever done anything? You know, have you ever been in jail? So do you have a clean background? And are you associated with anybody who's trying to hurt the United States? Gotcha. Okay. So obviously a thorough evaluation process because very. it's a very important job. And then you went into what department? Like what, how? Describe to me how you actually fit into the operations of the CIA. Sure. So I did surveillance, counter surveillance, executive protection, that type of stuff. I was not an analyst, so I'm not like that smart. So I was more of a, I don't know, for lack of a better word, boots on the ground guy. And I loved it because, you know, that's what I do now for a living is a private security company. So it's right up my alley, even though analysts are super important, do a great job, but that was not me. Gotcha. Very cool. And then how long were you do? You did that the entire time you were in the CIA? Yeah, I was there for seven years and... I mean, I had some amazing mentors there, like guys just top notch, amazing CIA officers. So I joined when I was 23. I got in. I was lucky to get in at a real young age. And I saw these guys and they were in their 50s, great, amazing CIA officers, but they were divorced or alcoholics or hated their wife and kids because obviously it's a tough job. It's a single man's game. And after seven years, at the time I was not married, I didn't have kids. And I was like, you know what? I kind of want to, you know, have a normal life, get married, have kids. And I saw the writing on the wall. So yeah, I left the agency after seven years. Gotcha. Gotcha. What you mentioned, you had some very strong mentors. Mm -hmm. Were there particular lessons or um, I guess ways of being that you acquired from those mentors? I mean, it was, I would say not traditional mentors, but traditional mentors in a way, like any other job, you know, you got the guy that teaches you the ropes. So, hey, if you have a office job, the guy who's above you teaches you how to do your office job really good. So these guys just taught me amazing things of, hey, here's, you know, here's the quote unquote spy stuff you need to know. Here's how to run a surveillance detection route. Here's how to keep yourself alive. Here's spotting, assessing, developing, recruiting, uh, all the things that you need to know. And of course, you get amazing training at the farm. So you go train at the, obviously, uh, facilities. Uh, that the CIA has. But of course, you learn from these guys that have a tremendous amount of knowledge, have been doing it for 20, 30 years, and you learn from them. And then you spend a lot of time in the field, obviously, as you said, boots on the ground, right? Right. Yeah. So yeah, I was not, again, an analyst. I was not a, I was, I was obviously, I was not in the basement. I, I was going to tell a story that I can't tell about when you screw. So there's that movie Office Space, right? 
And you know when you screw up, you get pro- put in the proverbial basement kind of yeah. thing. And so I know guys who did some stupid things and got put in the you know the proverbial basement. I was like, yeah, thankfully that wasn't me. So, do you have any stories from the field that are especially interesting? I mean, what I what I tell people is like, listen, most intelligence work is ninety nine percent doing your job right, boring, and one percent hold on for dear life. It's not like James Bond, because if you were in a shootout every day, if you're driving down a European city and you're Aston Martin every day, you've done something wrong. Mm. So a lot of it is extreme discipline. Like, I'll tell you one time. So a surveillance detection route, SDR for short, means, and I'm just making this up. Let's say you are a Russian spy. I'm trying to recruit you to spy for the United States. We've got a meeting later today. It just happens to be McDonald's. I don't leave my house, drive straight to McDonald's for our meeting. Because if I'm followed by surveillance, well, I've just led them to you and both of us are, you know, killed, jailed, whatever it might be. So a surveillance detection route means I leave my house, then I go to Walmart, then I go to Starbucks, then I go to Home Depot, then I pick up my laundry. And I'm making sure I don't see the same cars, the same people, I'll take one-way streets, all that kind of stuff. Once I'm sure I'm black, which just means clear of surveillance, then I go to McDonald's for a minute. So one time I'm doing that and I think a guy's following me. And of course, you never know for sure, but what you do is you do an intrusion point. An intrusion point is a fancy way of saying, go into a store and see if somebody follows you in, right? Mm. And they got to follow you in because let's use a place like Walmart, for example. It's such a big store. You could go out a back door to lose them. You could go out a side door. So they've got to follow you in to this intrusion point. So mine happened to be an olive oil shop and I go in and sure enough, you know, not too long after, this guy who I think has followed me follows me into this olive oil shop. Mm-hmm. And there's like no men in there. It's an olive oil shop. I mean, who's really going in there? But you always have to maintain your cover. So you can't turn around and be like, ha ha, I got you, sucker, because that would obviously not be good. They know you are some kind of intelligence. Mm-hmm. So you have to keep up the act. And so I'm shopping and, you know, hey, I'm, you know, talking to the lady. Hey, I'm buying some olive oil for a friend of mine. It's her birthday. What do you think? Blah, blah, blah. I grab this bottle of olive oil, teeny, teeny bottle. I take it up there. And the US dollar equivalent was probably like 75 bucks when she says this. And I'm like, you know, I don't scream this because I'm acting cool. Like, oh, 70. But I'm like, this stupid bottle of olive oil. You pay cash. You don't use a card, obviously, because you don't want receipts. So you buy this olive oil. And then you're obviously not going to your meetings. You know, you're being followed and you got to write an SDR home. So you got to run like a two to three hour SDR home. That way the boogeyman is not following you home. And when you do that, the whole goal is to bore your surveillance to death. You want them to think you're the most boring average human being, has nothing going on. And again, not the sexy stuff, but that's the stuff that keeps you from getting a hood over your head and crabby it out of you. Wow, interesting. So a lot of um, just trying to be anonymous, boring, um, throwing throwing them off your trail type of work. Right. I mean, the, I was just going to say the joke is when you're flying somewhere and you work for the CIA, obviously you have a cover. But if somebody in the seat next to you says, hey, what do you do for a living? You say, I work for the IRS. That way they'll shut up and nobody uh, wants to talk to you. So. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, okay. So you spent seven years in the CIA doing surveillance, counter surveillance, executive protection. What you said you left um, kind of wanting to have a normal life. Mm-hmm. And then you got in, you immediately got into the private security business. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what I love, what I know how to do. I don't have a lot of skill sets beyond that. I was doing a lot of corporate work. So it was almost like these billion dollar corporations, Fortune 500 companies, would sneak me in the back door when they had a problem. Let's say, hey, over in Brazil, they've got employees getting kidnapped. And we need you to help. And I'd never done any kind of corporate security work before. So I would be brought in. And again, these multi-billion dollar companies, it was eye-opening to me, would have like four people on the security staff. One guy may be United States, another guy may be in England, another guy may be in Australia, another guy in Asia or somewhere or whatever. Hmm. And I remember thinking like, this is your security team. Most of these guys have no CIA, FBI, or you know any kind of law enforcement or intelligence background. And so I was doing a lot of that. Um, but I hate bureaucracy. And so lawyers get involved in this and that. And many years ago, I went on that television show, Shark Tank. Mm. Uh, 
uh, a friend of mine convinced me to go. See, that's the the weird thing about leaving the agency. Like, I, I I love being anonymous. I don't care about anybody knowing about me what I'm doing. Like, I totally, you know, I'm I'm very introverted, right? But a buddy of mine, a business mentor, was like, "Hey, do you want to grow your business? Do you think what you're doing is useful?" And I said, "Well, yeah, obviously, I know it is because it saved people's lives." And it was like, "Then you got to get your butt out there and start promoting yourself." And so I went on Shark Tank, and that kind of opened it up to the masses where it was, quote unquote, the everyday Joe or the celebrity, the musician, the billionaire, not that, you know, they're, they're a little more wealthy than the everyday Joe, but, you know, not just corporations were now hiring me consulting work. Got it. And then, so you, you took the private security business on Shark Tank. Yes, I did. Yeah. yeah. Some training I was doing. I do some, one of the things I do is an escape and evasion training. So how do I escape duct tape? How do I escape rope? How do I pick locks? How do we commute with lie detector? Um, some evasive driving tips, all kind of that stuff. And so I was taking that, the teachings and trainings I do on Shark Tank. And I was lucky. I got a deal with Damon John and it worked out well for me. Oh, nice. Super cool. And what, so I'm sure that helped grow the business a lot. If you are a business owner or manager, you should know these three numbers. 36,000, 25, and 1. 36,000 is the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, which allows you to streamline accounting, financial management, human resources, and more. NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days rather than weeks, and to drive down cost. And finally, one, because your business is one of a kind. So with NetSuite, you get a customized solution for all your key performance indicators in one efficient system with one source of truth. NetSuite is everything you need all in one place. Right now, you can download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash whatismoney. That's netsuite.com slash whatismoney to get your free KPI checklist. Again, netsuite.com slash whatismoney. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. It looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high-res 3-inch touch screen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI, UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Uh, you mentioned to me offline that private security business has been booming since COVID. Um, do you think we're moving into a world of more private security? Because it's something we talk about in Bitcoin a lot that the state uh, seems to be getting worse at its job over time. And so people are kind of taking matters into their own hands increasingly, uh, perhaps reflected in, in the, the boom in the industry you said has happened over the past three years. Do you see the world headed that direction where more people are kind of independently securing themselves uh, rather than just depending on, say, typical police protection? A hundred percent. Absolutely. I mean, again, I'm I'm living proof of that just because during the pandemic, we went up like a moonshot of the calls, the clients, the people calling me. And obviously, you can't turn on the news without seeing something like, you know, murder rates in so-and-so city are at a 30-year 30 30 high, or carjackings are at a 30-year high. Uh, the government barely functions. We know that. I mean, both sides of the aisle are incompetent. Nobody knows what they're doing. Uh, the government's a mess. So, yes. Yeah, I think private security is only going to grow like crazy. Um, you know, I have so many people call me who are like, hey, I never thought I was going to do this. And these are wealthy people who can afford it, but, you know, now I realize I need it. And they say, you know, I'm not famous, but I've got a multi-million dollar net worth and I just want to learn all these things. Or One of the things I do often is a home security audit. So a rich person will fly me into their house and I do a home security audit. Like, here's where you need the cameras. Here's where you need the passive infrared sensors. So you pick up motion of movies coming. 
Uh, here's the alarm system you need. Here's the door barricade and all that. And that, again, the pandemic picked up like crazy because, I mean, I think the FBI stats are a home invasion occurs every 15 seconds. And same thing, every time you turn on the news, there's some home invasion anywhere, even in my small town in Utah. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, yeah, I think the security business is unfortunately never going to slow down because the world is just going to get crazier. What do you think's driving that? Like, what is what is it over the past three years? What has caused this deterioration in the social fabric and, I guess, demand for more private security? Well, I mean, it's you know, this is a you know, I'm a Christian, I'm a religious guy. It's values. I mean, people think they should be able to do whatever they want. If you don't punish people for their acts, what do you think you're going to do? So. California, San Francisco, perfect example. If you let people shoplift and you slap them on the wrist, what do you think is going to happen? Um, I can give you another perfect example. My executive protection company does a lot of bodyguard work with musicians. And so we were doing a concert in Chicago, and this was you know, a couple months ago, let's say four to six months ago. And where all the tour buses were, after the concert, two guys got in a shootout. And when the police got there, my head executive protection guy met with them and the guy said, hey, you know, did anybody get shot? And he said, no, it was, a, you know, it was a miracle. He's like, so nobody's bleeding, nobody's hurt. And my guy goes, no, no, nobody's bleeding, nobody's hurt. And he goes, all right, well, we're out of here. And he said, wait a minute, you're not going to file a police report? You're not going to look for the guy? He says, no, why am I going to waste my time? If I found the guys, they would be out of jail and within four hours and nothing would happen to them. So the police realize they're not going to, you know, their job is pointless. And I don't say pointless, meaning... If they arrest these guys because of prosecutors in certain places, that arrest is going to be pointless because they're going to be back out on the streets. Uh, so that stuff is unfortunately looks like it's not changing either. And it's, I mean, it's a moral decline. I don't care. Anybody can say I'm crazy or some religious nut or whatever, but that's what it is. It is a massive moral decline on right versus wrong. So if we try to get beneath that, and you, there's a moral decline, we're not punishing crime sufficiently. What in your estimation is driving the moral decline in society? Or uh, is this what we're starting to get away from God? I mean, what, what is in your view? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a hundred percent what it is. It's, it's, and this is the stuff that is absolute truth, but people do not like to hear it. It's people don't go to churches anymore. We've seen those stats, you know, ever since the seventies that the decline of going to church. But the big thing is the family unit. When you do not have a mom and a dad there, and obviously things happen in life and people get divorced and whatever, but the family unit is the foundation of society. And I don't care again what your religion is, that is a fact. So people always say, Hey Jason, like what are the most important things on the world? And I say, God family, country. And they're like, you know, why is it in that order? Well, obviously God is the most important part because that's why we're here. You know, God made us all. And if you don't have a family, you don't have a country. So the family unit where people are like, no, we don't need to be, you know, uh, be married to have kids. Let's just have kids. Or, you know, those people are like, hey, I don't, you know, I single women or like, yeah, I don't want a man. I'm just going to adopt a child and whatever is you've got to have strong family units. You've got to have parents who are good role models, or if not a parent, an aunt, an uncle, somebody who teaches you know, a woman how to become a woman, a man how to become a man. And every time I say this, of course, I get haters and trolls and whatever, but that is a fact, guys. It is an absolute fact of why we are going down the toilet. Yeah, I would agree that the nuclear family is definitely cornerstone to uh, social cohesion, right? It, it's... It's how we transmit culture. It's how kids learn to, as you said, to be a woman, to be a man. Um, and there's a lot of, in in kind of the Bitcoin slash money space, there's a lot of discussion about since we went off the gold standard in 1971, there's a big divergence between wages and productivity such that basically one income was not sufficient to support a family anymore. So you couldn't have the traditional model of Dad goes to work, mom stays at home, takes care of the kids. That that model became much less economically viable. And so I I can't help but wonder if it is, you know, we're, we're debasing the money that's actually dissolving the nuclear family to some extent. It's making it much harder for people to have these traditional family units 
And if you can't have that, then that's obviously uh, corrosive to society at large. Yeah, I 100% agree. I mean, it, the problem is, of course, that we're a consumer nation. We love to spend. So I live below my means. I'm very, very conservative with my money. And I see people who I know make less money than me. And of course, they've got the latest car or the latest gadget. It's like, I got to save. Saving isn't fun. Saving is sexier. People are like, hey, Jay, my wife stays home. I got seven kids. And let me tell you, wow, this day and age. Seven kids. Congratulations. Seven, well, it ain't cheap. I can tell you that. <laughs> um, yeah, seven kids is not cheap at all. So my wife stays home because that was something we wanted to do. And obviously, I don't own a fancy car. I don't own a lot of stuff. We don't live in the world's nicest house, but I could care less about that stuff. You know, I'd rather have my wife stay home. So I get people like, hey, Jason, you know, how do you do it? And I'm like, well, you buy a new car every year and I've never purchased a new car in my life. I drive a beat old pickup truck mm -hmm. or just bought this house where you're going to be tied to a 30 year mortgage, barely making it. And my house is much more affordable, you know, even though it's not a, a multi million dollar mansion like you live in. So it's, uh, it's consumer spending too. I there are certain people obviously who have to have two uh, husband and wife work who just can't make. It. But I'd say for a, a significant amount, it's if they really cut their expenses and didn't want to live the super first world lifestyle where you can order DoorDash for every single meal, then they can make it. If they cut back. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you mentioned to me offline again going back to my Bustamante conversation. He really laid out a ton of psychological tools and techniques that CIA operatives use. And you said that CIA guys are known as the world's best salesmen. Uh, could you elaborate on that, what you meant by that? Yeah. So what I meant by that is if you are, I'll use you again, if I'm going to Russia and you're general so-and-so, you're general Boris, and we're trying to recruit you to spy for the United States, you've got to be very, very good in order to get somebody to betray their country, right? You're asking them to commit treason. If they get caught, they're going to be killed. So to convince somebody to do that, you've got to be excellent at sales. Now, here's the thing. The, the way you do this, the recruiting cycle is called the SADR cycle. Spawning, assessing, developing, and recruiting. Uh, I'll run it through real quick for you. So let's say, let's just say there's a, a biological weapon being developed in Russia. And there are five scientists who have access to this, who are probably developing it, right? So spotting is, hey, what intelligence do we need? And, and let me go spot the people that have, you know, who might be doing this, right? So spotting is who might have what I need. Assessing is when I locate, okay, these are the five scientists. Then I go check them all out and see which guy is the one who's really doing it. Is it all five? Is it one out of the five? Maybe in this case, it's one out of the five. So I've spotted, I've assessed, now I got to develop this guy. What does developing mean? Well, in very corny salesman terms, you run surveillance on this guy, you know him better than he knows himself. So you happen to work out at the same gym, right? And then you're walking on the treadmill next to each other and you're reading a book about sailboats. And he says, hey, I love sailboats. And you're like, what a coincidence. I didn't know you love sailboats. So do I. I mean, salesmanship 101, right? But you know this guy so well. You make him your friend. Um, with the U.S. government, you obviously have plenty of money, meaning this guy's probably a poor government employee. So you take him out to dinners and you always pay because you say, obviously, you don't say you work for the CIA, but you say, hey, my company over in America, they give me this huge stipend. And if I don't use it, it's wasted. So let me pay for you. We're all familiar with the law of reciprocity, meaning you give people so much stuff, they feel obligated to you. So you take him out to dinners, you buy him stuff. Let's say you're walking down the road and you see a, a very fancy suit, right? $2,000 suit. And you're like, hey, I need a new suit. And this guy's like, oh man, you're so lucky. He's like, guess what? My stipend this month is $4,000 and I only want one suit. Can I buy yours? You buy the guy's suit. You make the guy fall so in love with you, then you go recruit him. Now, you don't recruit him until you know he's going to say yes. Because if I came to you and I was like, hey, Boris... I really don't work for this American company. I work for the CIA, want to spy for us. And he's like, absolutely not. He goes, tells his bosses, and you got to hop ship out of that country quickly because you're a deep crap. So you don't go pitch somebody and actually try to recruit him and say, hey, Boris, I work for the CIA. You ready to be a spy with me? You know he's going to say yes, or else he would never do it. So spotting, assessing, developing, and recruiting. Again, salesmanship 101, but I always tell people, you know why agency guys are so good? Because the stakes are higher. 
If you go knock on my door to sell me magazines and I say no, well, you don't really care. If you screw up in the intelligence world, kind of a bigger deal. So you're a lot more motivated. So it's not like anybody can do it. It's just, do you have the discipline? Do you spend the time researching? I mean, in my private security company now, I do a ton of deep, deep research on everything, on the client, on the threats they have, the threat analysis. And most people are too lazy these days to do the deep, 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 deep research that they need to do. Wow. So then you're selling treason. Right. Yeah. And it's the seven, every intelligence service in the country, in the world, excuse me, is selling treason. So unfortunately, there are CIA people and FBI people who betray the United States and go work for China, Russia, North Korea. The only difference is when an American commits treason, it's usually for money, right? They say, hey, you know, I, I'm broke. I need money. When, a, when somebody else, meaning non-American, when a foreigner tries to help the United States, often it's for their children. Meaning they say, hey, I want to be able to come to the United States one day and have my children go to the best schools. Or I want my children to have the best books or the best opportunities in life. So that's a big difference between greedy Americans and other people who spy of the United States is they obviously want their kids to be well. And so that was the SADR cycle. Is that what you call that? Yes. Yes. Spotting, assessing, developing, and recruiting. So that sequence sounds like it requires a lot of duplicity on the part of the operative, right? That you have to pretend so to be someone you're not for a long time, right? To induce this guy to to flip. Does that take a psychological toll on the operative? Like kind of living that so, lie? The most important thing when you're building any cover is remember these words for all of you who are going undercover. Uh, parallel the truth. Parallel the truth. Hmm. So I'm married. I've got seven kids. I run a private security company. If I were to go undercover next week, I'm not going to be a single guy who is an airline pilot who has no, you know, no kids because I don't know the first thing about being an airline pilot. Hmm. So you build your cover to parallel uh, the truth. That way, it's much easier because you can say, you know, hey, I don't drink because of my religion or I don't smoke because of my religion or, hey, you know, I like to skateboard because I used to skateboard, whatever it might be. So that's the important thing. Uh, but you've got to believe in the mission. I mean, you're helping the United States of America. Most agency people are very patriotic. You're obviously not doing it for the money because you're not making much money at all. It's you know you're helping the country and keeping scumbags out of it. Does that take a certain personality profile to engage in work like that? Because I obviously I've never done this, but just hearing you say it, I feel like it would be extremely stressful and difficult. So I'm imagining I, there's certain types of psychological profiles that are better fit for that work than others. I've had my psychological profile done a million times, and I can't even tell you what it is. <laughs> I mean, I can't remember. You know, I don't remember how many there are, like the SNTE or your whatever. I don't remember what it is. I can tell you it's type A guys and gals, like very type A personalities, very patriotic um, because they're type A, super competitive, and very good at compartmentalizing. Mm -hmm. Meaning, like, I'll give you the perfect example is in real life, I'm the world's most honest guy. Like, you're not going to see me lie. I'm a straight arrow. If I get pulled over by the cops, I would never in a million years lie and be like, you know, I'm whatever, making up some story. When I was with the agency, it was my job to lie. So there was no guilt associated with it because that was my job and I was doing something important. So, you know, leaving the agency, again, I would not lie because there'd be a tremendous amount of guilt because I'm a liar. With the agency, when I'd lie and, you know, use an alias, that's obviously not my real name, no guilt because I was doing my job. And I had zero qualms about doing my job. Wow. So definitely compartmentalization has got to be a uh, part of the skill set, I think, to do something like that. Uh, are, are you, when you're on these missions, are you like, you're on the mission, then you're back home. So you're having to switch between these personality types. Everything is different. Sometimes it may be you're gone for two weeks. Sometimes it may be a TDY for six months. Sometimes you may, like I had a buddy who was in one country for 20 years almost. Um, I can well, I can say that because I'm not going to give anything away. He was a Japanese American. So he looked Japanese. His mom was Japanese. His dad was uh, American. He spoke perfect Japanese. So he was a perfect guy to be in Japan because spoke Japanese, looked Japanese, you know, nothing American about him if he didn't, if he didn't know. 
So it, it really is case by case. It depends. Wow. Sounds like a really difficult job. Um, okay, let's go back to the private security training work that you do. One of my highest health priorities is keeping my brain in top shape. To take care of my brain power, I do many things, such as striving to read, write, exercise, and meditate daily. One of the latest tools in my brain power toolkit is MindLab Pro. MindLab Pro is a nootropic supplement that is scientifically proven to enhance your brain power. When I take MindLab Pro, my mind feels like it has a better grip on the world, my thinking is more lucid, and the articulation of my speech is much more clear. MindLab Pro has been tested in rigorous, double-blind, placebo-controlled human trials and has been proven to enhance brain power for users in every age group. MindLab Pro is an advanced formulation of 11 nootropic ingredients and is backed by research from 1,473 human trials conducted over a period of 32 years. So if you're looking to start enhancing your brain power, MindLab Pro is an excellent solution. Go to mindlabpro.com slash breedlove to start enhancing your brain power today. Again, that's mindlabpro.com slash breedlove. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin-enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it. Legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian, Chris Rock. Insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to. There's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. And I give a company some money in case shit happens. Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? So with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. You said one of the areas that you instruct people on is escape and evasion. What does that consist of? So kidnapping threats for clients to travel overseas. Um, duct tape is the number one way people are kidnapped, meaning they duct tape your wrists, they duct tape your uh, feet or whatever. I teach people how to escape duct tape, how to escape your duct tape to a chair during a home invasion. Um, I talk about here's how to escape out of zip ties. Here's how to escape out of rope. Here's how to escape out of handcuffs. Handcuffs are very unlikely to be used in the United States by corrupt cops trying to shake you down or whatever. But overseas, especially in Mexico, so outside of the United States, you're more likely to have a corrupt cop pull cuffs on you. I'll tell your tell your guys real quick. If you want to know how to bribe the police overseas, it's easy. Here's how to do it. Here's how I've had to do it. The long story short is one time I'm overseas, somebody with me does something stupid. Cops are surrounding us, and they're threatening to take us to jail. So first thing you do is play the stupid American, which is easy for most of us, and apologize. Oh, I'm so, so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. And the magic words you say, obviously, you don't take out a fat wad and say, okay, officer, what is this going to cost me? Here's, you know, my 500 bucks. You play stupid. You say, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You say, officer, I bet there is a fine to pay. How do I pay that fine? Mm -hmm. In my case, the cop said, it's a $50 fine and you hand it to me right now. In my mind, I was like, you idiots. You could have had me for 10 times that amount. Mm -hmm. Obviously, and he said that I'm like, oh, fifty dollars, that's so much money. I'm so sorry. And you know, I'm, I'm like, oh, okay, here's the money. Hand the cop fifty bucks. We are on our way. So just say, what is the fine? Because on the off chance, it's not a shakedown. They'll say, oh, you pay it Monday morning at the courthouse, and it doesn't look like you're trying to bribe a cop. But I've had so many clients have to use that line in Mexico. I don't go to Mexico. No amount of money they could give me to Mexico. I don't care if you offer me. $10 million tomorrow to go to Mexico to travel, not going to happen. Um, but have cash on you in Mexico if you go there because you're going to get a shakedown. Why is that just because corruption is more prevalent? Yeah I, yeah, I mean, I know things. Not that, again, when I say I know things, it's not like anything that really the average American doesn't know, meaning you know how dangerous Mexico is. You know how the cartels run it. You know how is the moment you step off the plane in there, you're a target, and they're looking for these dumb Americans to kidnap, to do express kidnappings, and get ransom out of them and all that. 
So I just, I know too much about the craziness, the corruptness that, I mean, I had two billionaire clients, they're brothers. And I didn't know this, but Mexico produces something like 90% of the uh, LCD TVs in the world or whatever it is. And they wanted to bring me down in Mexico to do a bunch of security trading for them, for their company, because they'd been kidnapped or one of the brothers had been kidnapped. And I was like, guys, I don't go to Mexico. And they're like, Jason, we're going to set our bulletproof limo. You'll have 10 bodyguards with you at all times. And they said, guys, I can step out of my house in Utah any day of the week, and I don't need a single bodyguard. And I don't need a limo that's bulletproof. They ended up coming to Las Vegas, and I trained them there. But it is just my life is worth enough, and there's too many other beautiful beaches and places in this world that I have no desire to go to Mexico and will never go to Mexico again. Wow. So you would put Mexico then at the top of the heap of corrupt countries in the world? Well, I mean, there are places I'm not going. Cuba, I'm not going. Obviously, North Korea, Iraq, or you know, those common things. But of normal places where people are going to go, I would not go to Mexico. I mean, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And I have so many clients there that are like, I'm going to Kabul, I'm going here, it's safe, it's safe. And an incident almost happens or an incident does happen. And then they realize, okay, I should go somewhere else to the beach instead of Mexico. Oh, gotcha. Okay, on the private security training, you also said you teach people how to become a human lie detector. How do you do that? So there's a, I mean, as I said earlier, when you get polygraphed, they baseline you, meaning they ask your name, they ask, you know, hey, is it Tuesday? Is it raining outside to get to know you? Then they ask you the hard questions. So there are many ways that you can detect deception and they're not that hard. I mean, you don't have to have any CIA training or any polygrapher training. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one of my favorite ones, a very easy one. As human beings, we are not made to lie. So if I ask you a question, you're being honest, you can immediately answer it because it's an honest, truthful question. Your brain doesn't really have to think about it that much. Like, hey, Jason, did you work at the CIA? Yes, I did. Hey, Jason, did you pay the electricity bill? Yes, I did. Hmm. When we're lying, our brain kind of wants to buy time and think of that lie. So somebody may ask a question. You're like, can you repeat that? Or they may say, um, um, um. Well, they come up with a lie. So here's how to do it. I'll give you the, the perfect day so anybody can use this. When I'm interviewing people for my company, sit them down once they get to me for the interview. You know, I say, hey, where are you from? You know, just ask all the normal, how's the weather type of questions. And then completely out of left field, I say, tell me the last time you stole something. Most people have a normal human reaction, which is, oh, in seventh grade, I stole stickers from the supermarket. Oh, in high school, I stole money out of my parents' wallet. Normal human reaction that we all did, right? Mm. One time, it's a true story, I had a guy and he's like, uh, uh, he's like deer in the headlights type of look, right? He's nervous. And I said, hey, you know, don't, don't worry about it. What's, you know, what's going on? You know, I said, we all stole something. He says, well, I used to work for a bookkeeping company and I was a bookkeeper. I stole a ton of office supplies because I was going to set up a, uh, a, uh, a competing, excuse me, competing bookkeeping company. But then I realized I didn't want to do that bookkeeping company. So now I'm here for a job. So there's a grown man stealing a bunch of stuff from his previous employer. Obviously, I didn't hire that guy. Same thing. I don't hire people who do drugs. Another story. I've got a guy. I baseline him. How's the weather? Where are you from? What do you like to do? What are your hobbies? Hey, tell me last time you uh, did drugs. Most people, again, don't get terrified in the face. They say, I smoked weed in high school. I smoked weed in college. Okay, big deal. This guy got a nervous look in the face. I said, hey, don't worry about it. We've all done it. He says, well, I do hard drugs on the weekend, but I never, ever do drugs during the week. It won't affect my work because I never do it Monday through Friday. I didn't hire that guy. So that is an example of you know, how to detect deception and, and see if people are being honest or not. That's funny. Uh, reminds me, I think Mark Twain said something like, if you tell, always tell the truth, you never have to remember anything. Right. Yeah, so just, exactly. Uh, um, does eye movement have anything to do with it? I've heard something about if you watch people's eyes, I can't remember if it's they go left or yeah. they go right, it tells you whether they're being honest or not. So yes and no. When I'm training and teaching people, I don't use it only because you have to know if the person is left-handed, they have to know if it's right-handed. Mm. It's not always, doesn't always work. Like, okay, they looked up to the left, now I know they're lying. So it's one of those things that sounds good on a TV show where they're doing it, but in real life, it's too hard, which is why, I mean, another one, super easy one. I tell people like, we lie with our voice all the time, right? 
but we don't control our heads very well. So I say, pay attention to the direction the head nods. Mm. So if you say, hey, Jason, have you ever murdered anybody? And I'm like, no, I've never murdered anybody. You would pay attention to that my head is shaking. Yes. And I'll give you the perfect example. I don't care what anybody's politics are. When Hillary Clinton was running for president, Diane Sawyer, I believe it was a 60 Minutes interview she was doing with Diane Sawyer. And Diane Sawyer says to her at one point, like, you and Bill Clinton have a wonderful marriage, don't you? And she goes, oh, yes, it's a wonderful marriage. And you see her head ever so slightly going, no. We obviously know they don't have a great marriage. Um, no. So pay attention to the direction the head nods. Like, And I do this too. When I'm interviewing people, and sometimes people are like, no, I've never stolen anything in my life. And I'm like, you're kidding me. You've never stolen? And they're like, no, I seriously never. I'm making sure that that head goes no and that I don't see any movement where I might be going, yes, tell me the truth. That's fascinating. I would assume that operatives are trained to counter this lie detection. Like if you're in the yeah. field and you've got, and you're selling treason, then you need to be able to lie and not be detected. Are, what are the countermeasures to this? Is it just practicing, controlling your head movement and these other things? You've so practicing and knowing what your tell is. We know that everybody has a tell, right? A really bad one. And so what we'll do is we'll videotape each other and we'll, you know, do very realistic scenarios where you're being interrogated or whatever. And your tell may be, hey, every time I get nervous and I'm lying, I grab my nose. Or, hey, it might be grabbing the neck kind of stuff, right? Or maybe my tell is I, you know, run my hand through my hair kind of thing. So what you do, interestingly enough, is most of us are going through a Washington Dulles, uh, DC airport, right? Washington Dulles International in Virginia, Northern Virginia. You assume as soon as you're headed to that airport, if you're going so overseas that you're under surveillance. And if your tell is grabbing the back of your neck, you might do that, not like a crazy person, but you may do that every so often. That way, anybody surveillancing you is like, hey, guess what? He always grabs the back of his neck. That's his baseline. Or he must have bad allergies because I always see him pushing up his nose. That way, when you're being interrogated and you still do that stuff, it doesn't stand out. Uh, so that, that, that's one of the ways. is just videotaping yourself in a high-stress situation scenario kind of thing. And most people are like, no, I don't have any tells. I, and it's like... Believe me, we all have tells. Yeah, this r reminds me of uh, when you play poker, right? Like if you can find the guy's tell when he's bluffing. Right. Yeah. Then, yeah, that's, um, I guess, something that's unconscious. So you would have to make the unconscious conscious, and then that would be your your technique for your, your countermeasure, I guess, to lie detection. That's 100% right. Most of us have no idea what it is. You need to identify and be like, okay, now I do it. You know, Now I know I actually do it. I never knew I did that before. And now I'm going to, you know, do this more often so it doesn't look like it's a, a nervous reaction. I'm lying. Have you encountered people in the field that, is, that are especially good at this, like that can escape so your detection? I'll tell you the people who are the best is, so remember, I was only with the agency seven years, but somebody who's been there like undercover for 15 plus years, meaning guys who've been there long term, they've been in the same cover They've been in the same place. Like, for instance, my buddy over in Japan, 20 years, right? Give or take. Like, the guys that have lived that lie so long, it's become second major. I mean, the horny way I can think of Think about a, a TV show actor who's been doing the same role for 10 seasons. They are so good, so absorbed in that role, they don't have to think about it anymore. That's so crazy to think that people do that. Uh, okay, you also said you teach people in the private security training how to disappear does this mean like disappear from uh, the public eye? Like, what, what does this mean when you say how to disappear? This means uh, your husband beats you and you are a domestic violence victim and you want to get to safety, right? Kind of thing. And the police isn't going to help you. Not, you know, you need to completely disappear so your husband doesn't kill you one day. Or maybe you got mixed up in the wrong crowd. You're now turning your life around and you want to make sure, let's just say, the mafia isn't going to find you. And so I tell people, because this is one of the things I do, is it's not glamorous. You would only do it if you had a serious threat to your life because you're going to a place you don't know and where you want to go. I mean, I can give you, again, the 30-second version of how to do it. You're going to a small conservative town in a conservative state. Mm -hmm. So you're going to a place like Utah, Idaho, Texas, Florida. And the reason is when you go there, 
you've got to have things off the table, meaning I need to go rent a, a townhouse or an apartment without them running all my information and checking my credit in case my ex-husband who's crazy has a private investigator who's so good who can say, hey, Jason had his credit checked by ABC Realty in Birmingham, Alabama or wherever, right? And you know, there are many small towns in America that you can do this that are, you know, 25,000, 30,000 in size. When I moved to Utah, just for the fun of it, I like to do it because there are these mom and pop realty shops, right? It's not Remax. It's not Keller Williams. It's not whoever. It's John Doe's property management. You go to them. They don't have anything electronic or any big database, meaning their database is internal. It's not going to be hacked like a Remax or whatever. And most of them, in my case, at least, when you hand them a check for the first month's rent and the last month's rent, a cashier's check, they'll just take it. They're happy as a claim to see that. And they take the check. They're not running a background check on you. They're not doing a credit check. So again, ask me how I know. I've done it. Very easy. The reason it's got to be a conservative place is you go to New York City, they want 17 different forms of ID. They want your firstborn. They want a blood test to be able to run a place. Right. You've got to be in these small under the table towns where you can still do this. Wyoming, plenty of places like that. So it's not going to teach anybody how to disappear. It's do you have the mental discipline? Do you have the mental discipline not, not to go see your friends at Thanksgiving? Do you have the mental discipline to spend Christmas alone? Do you have the mental discipline to stay off Facebook and all social media and not do something stupid like post your location? And most people, unless they have a dire threat, shouldn't do it because they won't have the mental discipline. They don't have, they're not motivated enough. Yeah. So obviously not a fun undertaking. So not at all. Probably not. a measure of last resort, right? Only if your life is being threatened, something like that. Correct. You said you, you're also teaching people evasive driving techniques. What Can you talk a little bit about that? What's up with evasive driving? Yeah. So we have 320 acres out in Utah. It's called Spy Ranch. I do evasive driving, escape and evasion, self-defense, all kinds of spy training, if you will. And so one of them is evasive driving. Like, how do I avoid a carjacking? How do I disarm somebody if they have a gun and point it at me? Um, how do I do the 180 degree reverse turn? How do I ram through a roadblock, meaning we put cars together and you have to crash through it the right way? Um, and I'll give you a tip here. This is a, a pro tip that hopefully nobody ever needs to use is I'll tell you how to trunk somebody. So what does trunk somebody mean? You're being followed at a high rate of speed, meaning you think somebody's following you, you're trying to escape them. Maybe they tried to carjack you. Maybe they tried to kidnap you and they're following you right behind you, right? Well, if you step on your brakes, the brake lights go on. And as soon as you see brake lights go on, what do they do? They slow down. That's normal human behavior, right? So trunk somebody, you're gunning it. They're gunning it. They're trying to kidnap you or kill you or whatever. You grab that emergency brake. You yank that sucker up. No brake lights come on. So they don't have that time reaction to stop. You hit the brakes, of course, because you pull the emergency brake. They slam into your trunk, hence the name trunk somebody. Their airbags go off. The radiator is hopefully destroyed. And yes, your trunk is destroyed. But guess what? You get to drive off and get to safety. And they're stuck with their airbags deployed, their car messed up, and you get to go home. Obviously, you're only doing that in a life and death situation. Wow. That is intense. Um, I'm assuming you have to brace yourself so you don't get whiplashed. Because that would be a, it's a pretty hard. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, you're making sure you got your seatbelt on. You're making sure you're trying to be as relaxed as possible, which of course is much easier said than done. But yeah, you're getting, I mean, you're getting hit hard, but it's, it's better than the alternative. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's, uh, I mean, it must be fun training that stuff out on Spy Ranch, but, um, training is awesome. Never fun to have to use any of that in real life, I'm sure. Correct. Um, okay. You mentioned, I'm a big fan of the book, The Art of War. Um, I think there's a lot of wisdom in there, um, just about the nature of uh, well, human nature and how to deal with conflict intelligently. Um, I think you mentioned you'd read that book as well. Do you have big takeaways from that book um, or specific applications that you've that you've drawn in your career as, re as it relates to that book? Honestly, I'd say the books, I mean, obviously I've read it, but the books, I mean, the CIA training was amazing, but I've read so many salesmanship books too, sales books. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think of one of them was a great one, How I Failed My Way to Success in Selling or something. Frank Betcher, I believe was the name. Mm -hmm. uh, but I read like the closer, I mean, all these different sales books, because I said, as it comes, you know, all it boils down to is salesmanship. When you're trying to recruit somebody to spy, it's salesmanship. How good are you? 
how much can you empathize that excuse me empathize with them how good are you will uh, you know, filling them out. It's almost second nature kind of thing. You know when you should shut up, you know when you should push, you know when you should pull back. Um, so I really enjoy reading a variety of sales books, to just be true, because, uh, you know, it's all psychology kind of thing. And I mean, obviously, uh, Robert Cialdini, all his books are great because human beings will never change. We're never not going to be greedy. We're never not going to be selfish. We're never not going to care about having more money or being famous or looking good or losing or whatever. Those things are going to be going on for the test of time. And I think that's what people forget is those simple human behaviors are never going to change, which is why you should you should study them so much. Cialdini, he wrote what? What's the book called? Influence or something like that? He wrote Influence and then he wrote Presuasion. Presuasion. That's right. That's yeah. what I've read of his. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good book, actually. Really talks about just how people think and make decisions and develop trust and all that. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. So it all comes down to salesmanship. That's right. Psychology. Good old fashioned psychology. Getting getting in people's heads and know what they want. <laughs> awesome. Well, I hope we've gotten into your psychology a little bit on this episode. I think it's been a very fascinating uh, tour of things you've done. Um, where can people find you on the internet? If you just go to spybriefinggear.com, again, spybriefinggear.com, you can reach out to me, shoot me an email, let me know about anything you need, and I'm happy to help. Awesome. Jason, thanks so much for doing this. Thank you for having me.